Hi guys, welcome. Um, this is a mini uh, e-lecture, so it's an about lecture um, for practical seven, the iron balance of module CM3292 on the analytical side. The aims of this very brief little lecture are to give you some insight into pH measurement, that is the measurement which is obviously so easy to do that everybody could do it and it's probably the most badly done measurement in the whole of chemistry. Um, to give you some grasp of the types of processes that give you precipitation matrices because that's what you're going to be analysing in this practical and to be able to quantify and identify the differences you find and the uncertainties you find. Um, it's not to brief you on the practical. That's what the practical script is for. Um, okay. Um, references, if you want a book that you can take to bed and read generally about this and other atmospheric processes, I've really got to recommend Peter Brimblecombe's book, Air Composition and Chemistry. It's a lovely little book, very, very accessible. And obviously the library has multiple copies. If you want a more detailed paper on this site of work, and again, this one is on IVLE, um, I would recommend Balas Brahmanian's paper. Um, he's using aerosols, uh, aerosol and rainfall samples from the same site, from my site, basically, on NUS campus. So, this is an interesting paper to look at if you are interested. And finally, because we're going to have to talk about pH in a, maybe not quite the way you've talked about it recently, um, I'd recommend, this is a very old version, there are more modern versions in the library, Skoog, Weston, Holler, Fundamentals of Analytical Chemistry. Okay, so let's start with the easy part. Let's start with pH measurements, because we've all done them. There's no problem here. It's easy, isn't it? Well, certainly the idea and theory behind it. Yes, we have a pH scale from 0 to 14. Uh, the neutral middle point is 7. And as an aside, one of the things in the practical you're asked to do is to calculate well, state and then justify, which therefore means calculate, the pH of unpolluted neutral precipitation. So here is a freebie for nothing. The answer is not 7. But I'll let you discover that yourselves. Okay, a schematic diagram of the sort of system that we use when we measure pH with electrodes. There is a glass electrode, and whether you are, com whether it's completely obvious to you, and often it isn't because often electrodes are combined electrodes nowadays, there will also be a reference electrode. The uh, glass electrode, which is uh, the pH electrode we use, is a single ion electrode, and there is a glass membrane here, which is the key to this particular electrode. Um, as part of the pH electrode, it has also a reference electrode within it, a silver-silver chloride electrode, in fact. Um, so the system actually composes of a glass membrane and two reference electrodes, as well as your sample, the, the greeny-brown messy colour there, uh, which your electrodes are in. Now, I should talk about for a moment that glass membrane. As with all single line electrodes, um, the potential difference across that membrane is actually what you're interested in. Um, this glass membrane is not your typical glass you put in a window, as you're aware. 
There are a range of pH glasses uh, which have these specialist properties. Um, a general robust one might be 22% sodium oxide, it might be 6% calcium oxide, and maybe just check number 72% silicon dioxide. But they're engineered around that um, because obviously uh, hydrogen ions need to be permeable through. Uh, that membrane or at least it's actually an absorption phenomena on both sides but nevertheless okay so that's the theory that's why it's so easy let's now look at a complete cell diagram for this and we begin to get a clue for why actually these measurements are not maybe straightforward so um, here is your second reference electrode, the one here, that's fine. Uh, you have junction, you have, um, this is a standard Kalamon electrode actually, and uh, you have the potential, half a cell potential of a standard Kalamon electrode. Then you have a junction potential between your electrode and the solution that you're doing your measurement in. Then you have the glass membrane and you have the uh, potential each side of that. Then you have your internal uh, silver silver chloride electrode here. Now if you count technically there are of the order of four different junction potentials in this cell. Most of you, I guess, know the book by Peter Atkins called Physical Chemistry. I have a very ancient second edition which shows you how old I am. Um, one of the things that characterizes Atkins' writing is his great precision of style and quantitative mathematical analysis of what he's talking about. I suggest you look at the chapter on half cell reactions and full cells in Peter Atkins' book. There's a number of books now, so I'm sure that um, you, this is quite easy to find. Given the background of such precise writing and numerical um, precision on electrodes as we're dealing with here and particularly junction potentials he writes and I quote it is widely thought and fervently hoped that these junction potentials cancel out that should be a strong warning to you that these junction potentials which everybody overlooks have the potential to change the measurement significantly and in fact they do. Um, typically you'd expect theoretically from the Nernst equation that the uh, response of a glass electrode to pH should be about 59 millivolts per pH unit. That depends on all of your concentrations of your, or rather I should say the activities, of your solutions in your pH and reference electrodes remaining as they should be. It depends on the junction potentials cancelling out and it depends on this membrane not being damaged but also not being aged because with all single line electrodes membranes age and then the electrode becomes increasingly less useful. Okay, an easy measurement, really. Um, this is what happens typically. Um, so we have a new pH probe with a new glass electrode, all the solutions at the activity they should be, and you get a decadal slope of 59 millivolts with an offset at pH 7 of 0. So this is your probe output because your probe output is obviously in millivolts and this is your pH. 
what happens as the membrane ages and some of those other things begin to change is this graph changes the slope of the line ceases to be 59 millivolts and you begin to get offsets um, which are taught telling you about the activities and the junction potentials now um, modern meters can help you mitigate this type of thing but they cannot solve the problems there comes a point when every pH electrode because we talk about this as buffering the pH meter it's rubbish you're actually calibrating the probe but there comes a point in every probe's life where the answer is the bin because it has got to a point where um, this line is no longer straight uh, this line is so far off that you reach the limits of the voltmeter which actually is what the pH meter is uh, to uh, mitigate that for you there are other changes as well um, lack of stability with an older probe you can place it in a, a, a solution and you can watch the pH over about three minutes slowly rise stabilize and slowly fall in fact it's a sine wave um, this again is a sign that the components of the pH probe uh, have passed their sell by date now you want to think quite a lot about how you do pH measurements um, don't necessarily believe the meter uh, they help modern ones help uh, but they're not going to solve all of these problems in the work you are doing random error is fine and for most probes you can devise systems which will mitigate random error it's systematic error which is your problem for the use that you are putting your pH measurements to in this practical and this is all about systematic error okay enough of that um, we'll talk now about about the precipitation matrix what it is okay first of all all precipitation is just very diluted seawater why you might say is that the case well um, the water which falls as rain uh, is originally evaporated from mostly the oceans also lakes but the vast majority from the oceans but that evaporates as pure water vapor what else happens is that there are many tiny particles of seawater which are ejected into the atmosphere um, I come from a different I obviously don't come from Singapore and where I come from you walk by the sea and it's often windy and if you wear glasses you find at the end of the day if you spent the day walking you have little spots on your glasses which are these tiny droplets of seawater which have evaporated on your glasses equally you can wipe your forehead and taste it and taste the salt what you're tasting is these tiny particles of sea salt and organics but I'm not too worried about them these are formed by bubbles bursting the, the film of the bubble bursts and then you get these tiny droplets and one of the other things is when a bubble forms it bursts the water rushes in and here you see a water beginning to rush in as the film is bursting and it injects a series of jet drops increasingly small drops into the atmosphere as a result of that single bubble bursting so you obviously get wave breaking as well which are larger things so here you can see a series of bubbles there's lots of bubbles here they rise to the surface and this is a 
a bubble at the surface and so the uh, this green is the film of the bubble, the thing you can see. When it bursts then that film become it, it's uh, basically seawater with a bit of organic in um, they become particles and they're called film drops and here you can see the bottom of the bubble is held the pressure is equal all round when that bursts the water then invades the bubble space and what you get and it's one here and it gets more here you get injection of these tiny drops here which you lose are called jet drops so basically uh, under normal circumstances bubbles in the ocean as well as of course breaking waves give you droplets of seawater in the atmosphere these because of the Kelvin effect which is high, high surface area to low volume you get it enhanced evaporation so depending on the relative humidity you get dry droplets of sea uh, dry particles of sea salt so um, these droplets end up in the atmosphere they evaporate which means you eventually get dry aerosol these are tiny particles they get moved around in the atmosphere and because clouds are like vacuum cleaners uh, effectively these small particles can get sucked into clouds now I'm not going to talk to you about uh, the way clouds work and uh, the vacuum cleaner or straub salga model of clouds uh, but effectively these tiny particles in the cloud water condenses around them and gradually those droplets are condensing around the particles grow the particles redissolve in the water and eventually they are your raindrops this is a very cut down version of this particular story and if you wish if we don't have pollution those rain droplets fall and we'll call them virgin rain or virgin rainfall and clearly because the source of the ions are from the original seawater the ionic ratios in that virgin rain are the same as seawater um, typically uh, we would use sodium there are no processes that we know of where sodium is either lost or gained in this process of evaporation and then through to droplets and refalling as rain uh, there are no processes we know of that change sodium so sodium is a very good tracer of seawater it's a so-called conservative tracer okay so just to uh, basically wrap up this uh, part of it we have our uh, dry particles here we get them sucked into clouds and various processes happen in the clouds and you can see water condensing around these original particles because of the temperature sometimes it's ice that's happening but they will not worry to talk too much about that um, and ultimately then all of what were originally the sea salt droplets then particles and then droplets again come down in the rain so the droplets that leave the cloud I've called virgin rainfall and on their way down from the cloud to the ground they scavenge they interact with gases and they pick up particles um, which is what gives us the uh, actual precipitation matrix that we get at the bottom that is the stuff we collect the stuff you're analyzing okay so your virgin rain raindrops then leave the cloud and fall down to the ground now in a moment we're going to talk about what questions the precipitation that hits the ground can answer for you but the processes that occur on that journey from the cloud to the ground 
change the composition of that virgin precipitation. So these raindrops are falling through the air, gases are soluble or not according to the Henry's law constant and according to how reactive they are. So for instance sulfur dioxide will absorb, uh, will dissolve into these droplets of rain and eventually they will form sulfate in the rain which then is going to alter the ion balance. Um, the raindrops are picking up, apart from gases, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide and others, they're picking up aerosols. Some of these old aerosol particles, sea salt aerosol, um, can have 8 molar sulfuric acid, 10 molar nitric acid associated with them. When the seawater splashes up tiny droplets, um, the seawater pH is 8.5 about. Probably within an hour, those tiny droplets um, have absorbed and reacted with enough gas species in the atmosphere that they are then acidic. So your raindrops are coming down and hoovering up these acidic particles. Um, other things that can happen in the aerosol phase is that you could lose chloride. Uh, there's a series of free radical reactions I won't bore you with. There is something in the resource, uh, there's a resource in your module folder on this. Um, so that's going to affect the chloride concentration in these aerosols which are then mopped up by the rainfall. And of course the pH will change. So many, many changes from virgin rain down to the rainfall that you collect. And therefore, these types of questions can be asked of your collected precipitation. Because what the aerosol has gone through before the rain hoovered it up on the way down is actually the history of your air mass. And therefore, you can ask your rainfall questions which relate to the aerosol that it's hoovered up, which relate to where the air mass has come from. Now, um, I think then probably we can move on. The properties of your precipitation will reflect the properties of the aerosol particles that it's hoovered up which will reflect where the air mass has been as well as what they scavenged on the way down. Type of things that we're interested in then in the collected rainfall at the bottom is the pH, the degree of sulfate enhancement, the degree of chloride loss. Um, something I'm not going to talk about here is air mass back trajectory there are various methods for finding out where an air mass has been, or at least predicting where it's come from, uh, which are called air mass back trajectory. And in your practical script, you have in the appendix just a, a picture. For now, and for your practical, you do not need, you know, need to know the details of isobaric or isentropic air mass back trajectory analysis. The important thing is, it's a reasonably good guide as to where the air has come from 30 hours before, 36 hours before, and how it's got to Singapore. In your data, you do have the angle at which it's come into Singapore. Um, that is probably enough information to give you an idea of where that air mass has come from. Basically, when we look at precipitation, we seek to reconcile the types of chemical signals we see with, for instance, the air mass back trajectory. Okay, this is a mini e-lecture. So, in summary, virgin rainfall has the same concentration ratios, ionic concentration ratios as seawater. Those ratios are changed by the air mass trajectory what the aerosols go through and then how those aerosols are um, mopped up and as precipitation chemists we seek to find a, a unified explanation for some of those changes. I think that's about it so good luck
enjoy the practical and I'll see you later. Bye bye.